Do you choose the path of transcendence or the path of understanding your own uniqueness? You can only choose one. Or is that so? Really, what I've come to understand is that that's a false dichotomy. It may not be spoken about directly like that, but typically we are presented with that path which is either directly or indirectly about the more sort of Eastern um, transcendent movement towards oneness, unity. Or we can follow the more Western path of more of a kind of like self-development approach and that can be through understanding kind of personality profiles or perhaps a little bit more spiritual with things like human design and gene keys or those kind of very mainstream personal growth paths like we might uh, think of that Tony Robbins teaches and often these things seem as though you have to either be on one path or the other and they have definitely got some sense of polarity, some sense of opposing views within them. As I say, over the years of going very, very deep, both personally, but also in the work that we do with others, I've seen that we absolutely can choose both paths. In this episode, a part two with Ian Watson, we dive deep into this question, do we have to choose one? And we talk about it very much through the lens of how a mythical worldview, looking at these things through the eyes of myth, allows us to walk both paths simultaneously. This is such a deep, rich episode. I think you're gonna love it. Let's dive in. Hello, Ian. A huge welcome back to the show. Hello, Leanne. Thank you for having me back. Oh, this is um, a conversation that I am really looking forward to having, even more so after our chat just now about the conversation. And um, it was one of those conversations where I'm like, okay, stop talking because <laughs> we are going to end up having the conversation we're meant to have on the show, which is always a good sign of my curiosity kind of already wanting to go there. So this, as you were saying, as you were saying, there is something very archetypal in itself around the way we can journey through these different aspects of really that that being human knowing who we are knowing the meaning of life knowing our ourself and the two particular parts of that archetypal arc that we're talking about in today's show oh let's see we could go all sorts of places but the two places we intend to go is the more like transcendent that kind of connection with all that is part of the journey and then also what you might call that descent. And I think depending on how how one looks at this and names it, um, that could be into the kind of more the human, we're looking at sh uh, shamanically, the kind of middle world, the more human. But then sometimes we might look at it through um, a lens of kind of also the soul. So it's kind of, it's it's more than human, but it's not quite the same as that sort of initial transcendent aspect that we were talking about. And so, as you rightly said, there is something in itself that's very like living a myth when we recognise that these two parts aren't actually in conflict as they sometimes can be seen, but they're all part of a bigger arc. So before we dive in to like talking about how that can all play out, I think as we were, as we were discussing before we began, I think just spending a bit of time defining what you and I both mean when we're talking about that more transcendent aspect of our mythological journey. So would you go first? What, what's that look like for you? What do you mean by that? How do you perceive it, talk about it, work with it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think I mentioned last time that when you asked me about my journey, an experience I had as an eight year old where I, I lost my sense of self as an individual and experienced a kind of opening up into into the the oneness which i didn't know what the hell to do with of course as a as an eight-year-old but it, i knew it was a magical 
experience and would be in some way life changing, which it, which it was. But that to me gave me a taste of that um, possibility. Let's say that there's there's a realm that's beyond the material, tangible, physical, which is just vast, and in which uh, everything is one energy, and and it and it's just like one. I think uh, Sydney Banks talks about it as one pulsating ball of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much how I experienced it and there's no separation between one part and another so that to me is you know it points towards the spiritual it points towards the universal um, that which is behind everything and also in everything and what in the quantum physics they you know they just talk about the energy or the energy for the quantum field of all things so to me, there's that dimension to life, which in some sense we all get a glimpse of, I think, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then what we're up against, <laughs> or what I was up against as a young boy, was like, and we're in this physical form, and we've seemed to be on our own individual journey, which has its got, has got its unique features. So, you know, it's like, which is it? Is, <laughs> are we all one, mm -hmm. and is it all universal, and it's all one and the same? Or is there something individually that we're here to grapple with and, and work out? And it seems to be both. And that, to me, is the, you know, it's like the juxtaposition of those two things. And as spiritual beings in physical form, that looks to me like that's the life, that's the game of life, as far as I can tell. It's somehow finding a way to navigate within that um, paradoxical uh, reality that... We, we are, on the one hand, part and parcel of everything. And you could say, ultimately, we don't even exist as a separate entity because nothing does. <laughs> and yet, in our experience, we are on a unique life path. And um, it doesn't seem to me like we, we all come in as a blank slate. It seems to me like we come in with preferences and tendencies and susceptibilities and potentialities which which get uh, activated during the course of, of one's life at uh, different stages. And this is where we see the archetypal themes and the mythical themes start to be played out. You know, when we recognize mm. that there are these cycles and seasons to life, which they can feel very personal and uniquely mine at the time. But what you discover is that these themes have been played out, you know, throughout for endless amounts of time and probably will be forever. So, yeah, to me, that's that's been my life's interest and journey is is having an awareness of the mystical transcendent realm. And yet, how do we also live in the human realm with that knowledge? That to me is the challenge. Mm. Oh, I, I love that you started with that experience that you you touched that place as, as a child. You experienced that. And if listeners haven't listened to that first show we did together, I'd very much recommend because it really sets the scene of, as you say, we all have our own story, our own journey with these things we can talk about them in a you know principles level but ultimately that we're all having our individual experience and it was this is um my own kind of like real standout experience of this nature is something i don't think i've spoken about uh on the show for a while actually I, ha I have in the past but i just haven't for quite some time which was going back to 2012 when my father died suddenly and up until then i think i shared this part where i'd spent you know most of my adult life really trying to like push away anything magical myth mythical spiritual and i was like at that point in the corporate world very much like just playing the game of being human and he died very suddenly, a very um, challenging death in many different ways. And it was the, the day I found out he died, I was being thrust into this experience where I was like, oh my goodness, there is, there's something so beyond 
this human world, this human life. And I first, it was, first of all, I couldn't really, it was like, it was a feeling. It wasn't even obvious. It wasn't like a, like absolutely transcendent experience like you experienced as, as a child. It was like happening in, in ways where I kept thinking, I remember this one particular conversation, which is like literally hours after we'd found out he died. And I was with my family. And as I was speaking, I was noticing like, I feel as though I'm connected to something where I can feel there's like meaning and love and beauty in everything, including his life and his death. And it was like, as I was speaking, I was like, where is, this is making no sense. Everyone else is like just shocked and you know, like all the things you can probably imagine. And I was just like, there's, there's something that I'm, that I'm speaking from feeling that's different, but I, what is this? And over, and then there was a, an experience I had um, in that first week where I started to realize like, it, it's like he's gone nowhere. He has in a human way, but like, there's something I'm feeling that's, that is undeniable that suggests this carries on, life carries on, he's carried on. I can still feel him. And that experience over the course of that next year became more and more like this just, this is like, I can't deny there is something beyond what I thought, you know, fit neatly into a human body that I've been like ruptured open to and is going nowhere. It's just becoming like greater and greater sense of how I'm perceiving the world that is like touching into this, um, and it wasn't like I, I, at that point, was starting to look at kind of more, you could say, like spiritual explanations for it. But mostly it wasn't about that. It was just like I was like feeling so different, seeing the world so differently. And I love the way you've started with that experience because we can, you know, we are going to get into kind of more ways to, you know, talk about these things and understand them in, in a moment. But I think... Ultimately, this is um, an experience that we have to one degree or another, maybe not as pronounced as you and I have experienced, but I think all humans have the capacity to feel this for themselves, to know this sense of, it's, it's even beyond the word connection, because connection suggests there so, like, can be a separation, but to like know ourselves as being part of everything, we all have this somewhere, this capacity, these experiences that touch upon this. And I think to start at that place is perfect because this isn't about teachings. This isn't about knowledge. This isn't about principles. This is about something that's just true mm. that we can feel for ourselves. Yeah. And, and in that sense, it is universal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As you say, mm. it's, it's accessible to everyone. And I, I know I've had many conversations with people or I've been in with groups where I've shared something about that story I just shared there. And, and suddenly people have remembered their own version, which mm. they, you know, they'd completely forgotten or they hadn't associated it with what I was talking about. And yet it had been a very powerful experience that they've had, which I think largely because of the, the bias that we have in our Western culture, it's easy to dismiss those um, experiences because mm. what do you do with them? I, you know, I didn't know, I, there wasn't anyone who I could even talk to about it um, for many, many years, let alone come to understand what that might be about. And I think, it, you know, a lot of people have that, they get a taste or they get a glimpse and, and then they just kind of brush themselves off and <laughs> get busy again. <laughs> but but you, you can't unsee what you've seen, you know? Yes. And something, it starts to work away at you on, a, on an unconscious level. And it, I, I, I've heard many versions of that. Yeah. Mm. No, you're so right. Because I, I remember in that year, as it was, as I was just like going deeper and deeper into that experience, it was becoming um, kind of inconvenient, really, because it was like, okay, you know, like, I've, I've dealt with much of the like more practical matters surrounding my father's death. Um, which again, because of the complexity of the death, um, it 
in the, in terms of like it, there was a you know criminal case going on you know post-mortems as well as you know his state so it was like a very it required a lot of very material practical actions that took that whole year actually to deal with and and it was like at the point where like I should be able to sort of go back to normal life I was just like I can't there is just no way I can like as you say like unsee what I've seen and it was at that point which was almost um a year to the date of his death a year earlier year before I was like okay there's something in what I'm experiencing that I need to share with others like there's something helpful here if I can journey through everything I've journeyed through over the last year and feel as I do there's something here that other people can benefit from and so it was that point where I was like, just like literally looking like, what what can I use to com help convey? Like where, where do the words come from that help people have this experience? And I was literally just looking for different, you know, methodologies, spiritualities that I could um, use or train in. And I had this another moment, this just like completely incredible transcendent moment where, and it's so funny, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but it was, um, I was Googling in my kitchen, I was in my kitchen on my laptop Googling and I'd seen a mention of the three principles somewhere else on some other website and I thought, oh, I'll just go and look up that thing, three principles. I'd never heard of it before. And what came back was some, you know, this again, but it was back in 2013 by this point, which was in those days, you know, like it, there really wasn't much like on the internet about three principles. It was like kind of, you know, particularly glossy or well formed. And I just had some like blog post or something come back that described like the three principles, mind, thought and consciousness. And I, I remember reading uh, Mind and I was just like, oh my goodness, that that's it, that's it, that's the one, that's what I've been experiencing, yes. And then the funny thing was, I kind of, I, I think a consciousness, it was just like, didn't really, it was just like, okay, that makes sense. And then I read the description of thought, and it always makes me laugh because the effect is so basic, but the effect it had on me wasn't, was anything but. I read the description of thought and it said something like, thought creates your reality. It was a very simple description, but obviously I must have been in a space where I was just, it, it had an effect. That, um, and I, I just went, oh, oh my goodness. And it was like, I, I describe it, because it's the best description I have, as it was like I had this, like, I was in the middle of a carousel and I could just see all my thoughts going around me. I could just see them as thoughts. It was just like this moment of like all these fears I had, all these beliefs I had, all of these identities I had were just swirling around me. It's just like, oh my goodness, that's a thought. Oh my goodness, that's a thought. Oh, and I was just like, <laughs> And it was it was as big a kind of moment as what I'd, I'd been experiencing in the previous year. So I was like, oh, my goodness. Well, that's what I've been looking for. So I immediately um, booked on a training course that began like weeks, like in weeks um, after that. And the funny thing was, um, I'd love to hear your experience in a moment of this, but the funny thing was, because I'd had like those two experiences, by the time I began this um, year long training, it was like there was nothing like everything they were saying. It's just like, but, but I don't understand. Why are you saying all this? It's not like it's just you don't need any of this. Like, <laughs> and, um, I had this really um, cringy moment where I actually asked the trainers at one point, uh, sorry, my dog's barking in the background. I, I, I actually said, like, I don't understand. Like, why do you have to, like, spend time telling people? Like, surely once they know, they just, like, it, it just, they have that experience. And everyone was looking at me like, what planet is that woman on? <laughs> um, so that was a whole learning in itself. It's like, oh, n like, for whatever reason, my own, like, wiring has me have like experiences of that nature but that's not the case for everyone so that's been a real lesson itself anyway i'd love to hear your own version of that how did you come into that way of uh sort of making sense of the transcendent experience yeah and i think that's that's um very much what the 
three principles understanding can do for us it doesn't do for oh. everyone but it, it it just helps you to make sense of, of your own experience in a in a fresh way which is very um affirming isn't it it's very reassuring mm. somehow when, and, it, and it was for me too but it's funny you describing your experience on the training i trained with kathy casey and mark howard who were both mm -hmm. lovely but i remember on the first weekend kathy casey she kind of sneaked up to me in the break she says what are you doing here you already know this <laughs> and and i i was really baffled by but i kind of i knew what she meant you know she she had i think she had the the wherewithal to recognize that for me it was the culmination of a long journey and i'd spent a lot of time you know looking into different spiritual traditions mystical traditions um meditation practices the mythical realm you know to try and make sense of my experience basically as much as anything else and this to me was was one it was one further piece on that journey but it did turn out to be a pivotal piece for me as well um I think chiefly because it, there was a simplicity to it that I really liked. Uh, it, it simplified everything. It, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't encrusted with a lot of dogma, at least not in my experience, you know, compared to other things. There weren't a lot of practices or there weren't any practices, actually, or things that you had to believe in. And I really liked that. You know, it felt very Zen to me. It felt quite clean as a teaching so I didn't need much of it either you know I, I just kind of I had no resistance to it I didn't spend long trying to get my head around it there was just something that I heard that made sense to me and I was like oh yeah that's really helpful and when I read Sidney Bank's description of thought um, in one I think it's in the missing link where he talks about it as the the mystical bridge between the formless and the form and something in that really spoke to me that thought when he's talking about thought he's not talking about this cognitive rational intellectual faculty um, which we tend to associate with that word he's talking about a much bigger thing that's going on he's talking about the creative force of life itself and and i think that's one of the you know one of the traps i suppose of any understanding and it's a, it's a trap that many people fall into with that understanding is that we get caught up in the terminology and then we miss the point <laughs> you know it stops mm -hmm. being a metaphor that points you to something beyond the words and and people get hung up on the meaning of the words or what mm. we think you know what we think those words mean and then people you know you can spend a long time going around in circles and i think that's often what happens when people come into this realm mm. is like initially they might hear something that really resonates but then they can easily get bogged down in the terminology of it, which is the opposite of helpful. <laughs> in my <experience>. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's funny because it's been so, so many years since I've been kind of in that community, in those conversations. And uh, you're completely right. So for me, it was like, as, as you're saying, it, the, the description of the three principles, it wasn't really like it, um, because I'd had that experience, it was just like, oh, it helps me understand it. And again, it was like recognizing it's only a metaphor because it only can be, but it's a helpful metaphor because it helps me kind of make sense of all of this, like, you know, pretty vast experience I'd had. It was most helpful for me in terms of now, how can I point others towards it? That's where it was really helpful. Like, okay, I've now got those words I was looking for. And yet, as you're then saying, it's so easy to take something like you say that's really quite quite minimalist and pure and doesn't have all this baggage dogma and then have it like you know chuck on lots of baggage and dogma and certainly at the point where i was really called into other aspects of again that human experience i was realizing like ah oh, this this you know i'm talking self as much as i'm talking about others this can itself become a dogma and you know there's a phrase that is sometimes heard certainly again back when i was in that community i don't know if it's the case now which is almost like this is the only thing you need there's nothing to do there's no no almost like there's no other technique understanding uh, that you would be of benefit to you this is all you need and i was starting to realize like huh 
that doesn't that's become despite the fact i'm like almost the poster girl for the like incredible experience it can like provide that's no longer looking true to me oh so i've just lost my <laughs> my uh, my uh, earphone just jumped out very dramatically um i was like there's there's more there's more and not even in a way where this is something that you have to do but more you know talking back to that um this being a mythical arc it's like oh my goodness how exciting how wonderful how rich there's more places to journey yeah um i love, I love that yeah i love and that's been very much my own experience with it too and uh, I think there's a couple of things I'd, I'd like to say in response to that. One is that, for me, one of the keys to, to bridging that seeming you know, chasm <laughs> between there's nothing to do versus, yeah, but I'm, I've got my own individual path here, you know, and it looks like there's all kinds of things to do. To me, the bridge between those two is what, when, what Sydney Banks talks about as wisdom, listening to your own wisdom and letting that be the guide. Mm. Because if we do that, honestly, and authentically we will be led into whatever realm is right for us you know at that particular stage in our life and in your case you know it, it led you into the whole exploration of soul and you know the shamanic work and so forth in, in my own journey it's included um, a lot of the things that were already interests of mine mm. with the mythological realm that interest has just continued to deepen and and become richer it's not something that i've um thrown off you know maybe i did for a little while because there is that tendency to throw the yeah. baby out a little did bit, you, you know? I did, like, yeah. was there a real yeah. kind of period where you're like okay that's this, no longer this true is it. Or yeah. needed yeah yeah but i i mm. you know i i kind of knew even when i was in that mode I kind of knew that I'd been through that cycle a few times already. <laughs> the chances are it's going to look different to me a little bit further down the line. But just to... Just Can to I just, of... Should I just say that there's something real, um, speaking personally, because I really recognise this in myself, there's, there's a real humility that comes when you've been through these cycles a certain amount of time and you're like where I used to be sort of quite, um, you know, an evangelist. It's like, oh my goodness, like, this is the thing. Everyone needs this. Everyone needs to know this. And after you've been through it, like, you're kind of like, hmm. <laughs> right. It, it, it humbles Perhaps you. Not. <laughs> yeah. but again, once you kind of know that, you know that. And yeah. at a certain point, it's going to kick in. But also, I, I said to you last time, I, I've been a big student of Joseph Campbell for a long, long time, and also Young's work as well, as, as I know you have. And one of the things that um, I remember was really helpful to me in Campbell's work was, um, because, I mean, a lot of his investigation was into the Eastern traditions, the Oriental, the mystical, and so on, not exclusively, but he really opened that world up to a, a Western audience. And again, that was part of my path. You know, I to try and make sense of my early experience i went i embarked on a spiritual path i started looking into buddhism and zen i ended up traveling to india i you know i visited a few gurus you know i really went in that direction mm, and, i didn't know that about you and it's interesting to me that when i when i listen to sydney banks and i and i read what he wrote from his own um perspective to me it's very aligned with the eastern mystical tradition mm. Yes, very much so. The you know the idea of the mm -hmm. the transcendent or the God force, if you like, is beyond everything, but is also in everything. Mm. That's not a Western Christian perspective, where you know mm. God created everything and then God's over here somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> pointing down at His creations. Yeah. Yeah, you know, God, God is in the heavenly yeah. realm, and there's this implied separation there between mm. heaven and earth, which you don't find in the Oriental traditions. So, and and also in the Eastern tradition, there's this kind of negating of the ego. You know, the mm. the personal is negated. And everything is, refer is pointing towards the universal and the mm -hmm. impersonal. Now, that definitely is, is a feature of the three principles teaching, as far as I can discern. However, what Campbell pointed out was that he says that the gift of the West is the path of individuality. Mm. That, to Campbell, was like, that's, that's been the, the Western path. 
has been to develop the role of the individual and what is it, you know, to really home in on what is it that's unique about this person's life path and life journey, that what's the unique gifts that they're bringing to the world and how is it that through, through going deeply into your own unique path, you do in fact then get in touch with this bigger universal realm. It's, it, all roads lead to Rome. Mm. You know, yes, see, yes, it, yes. It seems like it's the opposite, but actually it leads you to the same place. And so to me, that, that's a very interesting thing. And that to me is where wisdom is the, the bridge between the two, because by following your own wisdom, that is, to me, that's Joseph Campbell echoing, follow your bliss, mm. you know? Yeah. Basically, get, get in touch with where the juice is for you personally and honor that. And, and even if it means seemingly going against some of the teachings, You've got to be prepared to to go beyond the teachings at a certain point, mm. if if your own heart and soul leads you in that way. Oh, I I love this so much. It was um, listen to you then. It was bringing to mind. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Mihir Baba. He yes 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 you are. Ah, oh. um, did we talk about him at all in our last conversation? I don't we didn't. Think so. Ah, okay. That's, that's interesting. So most people don't go, oh, yes, when I, when I say my father. Um, there's a, a really great book that the name of the author escapes at the moment. It's called The Sound of Bells. And the author uh, comes from a Jungian background. She's a Jungian depth psychologist, I believe. And The Sound of Bells, she is really doing this um, incredible comparison, really, and interweaving of Jung's work and Mihir Barber's. And the thing that it, Mihir Barber was very vocal about, that very much mirrors what you're saying here, is that in the Eastern traditions tend to be, as you say, very focused on transcendence, that kind of ultimately like knowing oneself as God, and which is very much Mahir Baba's work. But the difference with Mahir Baba is saying, and this is, again, it's very contextual. The, the thing is that we often miss, particularly in the West, is these things make sense within a context. In the East, they have these traditions of gurus, of like being birthed into a culture that understands these things in a way that we don't typically in the West. And so he was, so this is obviously paraphrasing, those within the West, as you're saying, absolutely are here for that path of individuation. And there's this fabulous table in this book, which, you know, I love things like some, I'm a real geek, that has this like comparison of the stages of individuation through the lens of, I mean, it doesn't have to be Jung. I mean, obviously the stages of alchemy ultimately are, go beyond Jung's work, but it was through the lens of Jung's naming of this. As this table was sort of showing uh, that those stages of individuation through Jung's work and then at the point where you are individuated you could say that's when Mahir Barber's work kicks in it's like his his work doesn't really even begin until you're already at that stage and so it's like you need that you need to do that work ultimately as you say all roads lead to Rome but they they're both required, particularly for those of us in the West, where we really lack that context in which we can kind of almost like just jump straight to that Eastern understanding in a way that's actually kind of like most serving, most meaningful. Mm. And um, like you, it's that that's been, you know, very much been my focus and, you know, that of um, the work we do at what's now called be mythical in our various evolutions it's like knowing that that all exists knowing whether we call it oneness or anything like it's there and yet the journey for us as humans called to this is to kind of almost like to go down to come up it's like the indirect path um but again what what a wondrous mythical path it is yes oh yes absolutely and you know what, it, 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 when I was reflecting on this just before we got on the call, I, I, what came to my mind was, um, in, you know, in the Greek tradition, they had a whole pantheon of deities, mm -hmm. um, each representing different forms that that transcend, transcendent energy can take. And you could say that two of the almost polar opposites in that tradition would be Apollo and Dionysus. Mm, yes. 
And to me, that that's mm. you know, it's a perfect kind of metaphor for what we're speaking about because Apollo is like one of the sun, is a sun god, is a solar deity, and is very much to do with the light of consciousness and purity and truth and. You know, it's like elevated consciousness, essentially. It's reaching it towards the heavens. He's often depicted playing the lyre, you know, which is the heaven, mm. the uh, angelic uh, music of the angels, <laughs> which, which to this day they play in the, you know, in the, if you go to a Steiner school, like my daughter did, when the young children come into the nursery, the teacher's playing the lyre. Oh, because, really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I love that. <laughs> All the young kids, they learn the lyre at a young age because they, it's recognized by Steiner that they're still connected to the angelic realm, you know, very much mm. up, up until about the age of seven or so. Um, so they try and keep that alive in the children, which is very beautiful. But then you've got, you know, in that same tradition, they've also got Dionysus, who's a kind mm. of underworld, earthly god. You know, he's the god of wine and sex and death. It's like and... wine and sex are literally the two words <laughs> that come immediately to mind. What a brand. <laughs> Right. And you're not going to, you won't catch him playing a liar, you know. It's, 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 if, if he's into music, it's going to be flamenco or the blues mm. or salsa or, you know, something like that. And to me, that's, that's the life game. It's the totality of both of those seemingly very opposite energies. But it, we all seem to have a tendency to become one-sided. You know, that we, we kind of favour one of one mm. aspect over the other. And and then life has a way of, <laughs> of pulling us in whatever the direction that we've been neglecting. You know, whatever we've pushed away or neglected. Like in your case, you'd neglected the kind of spiritual um, dimension to life to some extent. You got very focused in the material. So that had to come kind of crashing in mm. to uh, upset that particular apple cart. And, you know, in, in my case, I was kind of open to that transcendent realm very early. And so I had that awareness. But I had, you know, my challenge has been how to live on the earth as a regular human being with kids and the messiness of life <laughs> mm. with that knowledge, with that awareness, um, like be, being in the world, but not of the world, so to speak. You yes. know. So, and yeah. I think, again, that, to me, it's a very individual thing. The starting point where we start from can be very different for different people. And also, what is it that we've neglected and pushed away? That's probably the, the direction that life's going to nudge us towards. Yes, yeah. What, what, what you were bringing to mind then was um, the way this notion, whether we call it uh, bliss, wisdom, intuition, um, the way that can call us, you know, if we allow it to, the way it can call us and lead us. And I've had so many experiences of, of that. Um, and what I was just pondering is, and there's, there's part of me that kind of almost has like this, like, yeah, but the, let me just say, I'm going to say the question, but I always want to always like say a sort of sub part to the question, because I think there is, there's so much complexity here. So there's part of me that wants to say, but Ian, you know, as well as I do, it's not as simple as that. Like even following our, being able to hear that wisdom and discern that it truly is wisdom and to then act on it in some ways isn't that simple because you know that's why the work of someone like Jung exists because of the the level of blindness shadow alchemy you know we need to go into places that aren't that easy for us you know sometimes they are the most painful shameful places and you know the for me it's been that work that and again i think because of the way that i was almost just blown open to the transcendent it's been that work that i've noticed has been like most um in some ways like truly life-changing because it's but it's taken much more time and attention and choices the and so there's i want to i want to ask you your thoughts on that but then there's this other part of me that's like and yet when I reflect certainly on my own uh, path, it was also intuition, I could say, that has led me through all of that alchemy too, that's led me to the very work that has allowed that to happen. So mm -hmm. there, that's, that's the kind of almost like caveat that I want to just add, because 
that's also true. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Uh, yeah, and, and that mirrors my own experience, Leanne, perfectly, because um, I've also kind of alternated between you know, finding what felt like this is the right thing for me to be doing, this is the right teacher for me to be working with, or you know, whatever form it's taken at a particular time. And it, and, and it has been. You know, I've, I, in my own background, it was in the healing arts, as you know, starting with homeopathy and then going more into the realm of emotional and psychological healing. And really, that was all, that was self-healing. <laughs> it wasn't, mm. you know, yeah. I was, it was <laughs> under the disguise of, of becoming a practitioner, but actually it was, it was all part of my own journey and dis discovering things about myself that I hadn't really explored up until that point. And, and yet, each of those pieces, as you said, were being guided by some, some sense of inner knowing that this is what's right for me and that, that isn't right for me. And also knowing when I'd kind of outgrown it, you know, knowing mm. when there was no, yes. there's no, more, there's no juice in this anymore. Mm. Um, even though I thought I'd found my thing for life, <laughs> which, you know, I, I thought that with homeopathy and I've thought it with a couple of other things since. And but welcome to my world, Ian. Welcome to yeah. my world. <laughs> but but that, that's a mythical theme in itself, isn't it? That's an archetypal theme of absolutely life giving birth to forms and then something takes form and we get to explore it and, you know, experience the richness of it we can only do that when it's in form basically mm. but then we somehow we get attached to the form and we think that's it yes. and obviously no form is it mm -hmm. because it's it's a partial expression of you know of the totality of all things and so there's always going to be something around the corner that we haven't caught a glimpse of yet um but isn't isn't that what makes it rich and fun and oh, beautiful it, and, it really is and, and there's room for everything in that, you know, to, it, to me, there's no, I don't see any conflict when, when I hear of people who've come through the, a journey with the principles like yourself, and now they're exploring trauma work, or body work, or, you know, what's the effect of this understanding, how can we bring this understanding to bear on physical health problems? That's something that I like to explore, because it's, we barely even scratch the surface of that as yet, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, yeah. It's it, it, that's the learning curve. Mm. <laughs> I do feel like it's a relevant conversation for, mm. for many people as well. And, and timely, as you said, I think yes. it's, you know, because there are there are things being played out, which I see now in the in the three principles world, which to me is very much examples of this, mm. this archetypal theme that we're talking about. You know, like there's a there's a polarization happening in certain areas, yes. people forming camps and mm. what have you. But it was ever thus, you know? <laughs> it, yes, exactly. It's so easy, whether it be that or something else, for us to think like, oh, this thing that's happening now has never happened before and it's wrong and it should be different. And rather than recognising like, oh, okay, it's just another one of those cycles, it's just life yes. doing its thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I'm really looking forward to listeners hearing this, actually. Like, this is one of those episodes. I'm like, I think there's so much in this for people, whether or not they're currently kind of like in more of a three principles way of seeing the world or the more, you know, like say, you know, soul, depth psychology way. I think there's so much in this that, um, and I'd be yeah. interested to know, because I'm guessing, you know, going back to what you asked me right at the beginning, like whether um, listeners already have an understanding of this. And I'm like, I think it's 50-50. I'd be really interested if your people... I'm guessing they're mostly going to be more of three principles um, kind of way of thinking. I'd be really interested to see what they get out of it as well. Well, yeah, not necessarily, because a lot of people still know me more from the homeopathy work. Oh, and yes, so on. of course. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of them have barely scratched mm. the surface of the principles stuff. So I've got I've still got a foot in different camps mm. as well. Oh, OK. So, so yeah. So we actually for both of our people that are kind of in our field, there'd be something interesting, I think, for all of them. Yeah. Yeah, but I think we managed to navigate it without disparaging anything, mm. you know, and without making anything wrong, basically. Yes. Which is is uh, an achievement in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if people are going to be offended, they're going to be offended, but it, it's not That's my inten intention, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, me it's, neither. Um, yeah, I, I think we did. Um, you know, again, I think there's some people who just are 
And this is what I've really realised, actually. We didn't get into this, and maybe for good reason. <clears throat> what I began to realise in that kind of, like, first year or two, as I was kind of, like, transitioning out of being kind of, like, very much in that Three Principles community, is, like, people have... You know, some people have got a lot on it, you know, as in, like, it's made such a difference to them to even yeah. start to question that sense of, like, this is all there is, really actually feels dangerous to them. You know, they right. may have had, you know, a real uh, experience of relief from whatever the thing was, you know, anxiety, depression, bereavement, whatever it was. And they don't want to risk that really understandably. Yeah, like, I, I, I am representing a threat by even suggesting there could be somewhere else to look. And yeah. um, that was a really, again, not quite humbling realization of like, you know, no trust that right now what where they are, it's right for them to be a no to what yeah. I'm talking about. It's actually quite but, dangerous for them right now or that, that is perceived yeah. as dangerous. I think that's such a good point. And it, and it might be that that's their path for the rest of his yes, lifetime. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's certainly possible. Um, I, I'm probably not in that category <laughs> i know that y'all know <laughs> no exactly you know? no it doesn't look that way it would be nice in a way easier <laughs> I know. I, exactly that's, that's, been, that's been part of my life story was like looking for the one thing that i can just stick with you know yeah <laughs> yes totally yeah it's uh, it's so funny isn't it how i think those of us that, that would have been like so, so like it feels appealing and yeah it's been like my life's been anything but that hmm. i don't quite know where this thought is going but you mentioned Steiner earlier, and as I'm sure you know, it's kind of one of those like funny, like little known facts about Steiner, but I'm, I'm sure you probably know this. He actually had um, a magical background. You know, he was deep into, um, yeah. you know, hermeticism, alchemy, all of those things in like a really deep, big way. And I, I guess, you know, the Steiner schools were almost like the like more acceptable face of things that, you know, aren't generally spoken about in most you know polite sort of society and it's let me just there's a reason this is like tugged my attention and i just don't know yet what the, the reason is um but the i think there's it was the fact that you in it's yeah you know, like by naming him you were naming that transcendent aspect of our experience and knowing that he understood both were there, you know, he understood, you know, the magical realm he often deals with very much that link between the human and the divine. And so yeah. he understood that just by the example you gave, he understood that he understood that there was, you know, things for us to do experience, see as humans as well as kind of almost just keep repeating the fact. And there's also the divine. There, there's something more here for us to explore, to experience. Um, it, it, was, it was a very practical um, philosophy, if we want to call it mm. that, that he brought in, which, the, you know, there's a whole aspect to it which has to do with medicine, the anthroposophical medicine, which mm. he created. The whole agriculture, biodynamic agriculture came from Steiner the whole pedagog pedagogical aspect, which is to do with the Steiner schools. I mean, it was vast, you know, but, it, but, it, but it, what, what all of those have in common was it was to do with life on earth in the physical world. Mm. You know, very, very practical. Very, very much so. <sighs> Maybe it was just I, I wanted to bring us back to that so that you could say that, but there feels like something really important in that as, a, as an archetype, really, as a model that that you know steiner as a man and his work was really bringing together all these different threads that we've been talking about is, is my sense of why that was tugging my attention but i'd love to know if there's anything else that you you see in that no i think to me that is the point as it looks to me now that is the point is is to for each of us to find a way to um i want to say live a spiritual life but also an earthly life mm. In, in, in equal measure, so that they're not seen as two separate things. You know, like a lot of people have the, the earthly material life for six and a half days a week, and then they go to church <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, or they, or they have the, a moment of meditation practice, and that's the spiritual life. And they're seen as kind of separate, 
And I think that's, you know, again, the tendency of the mind to just to become lopsided. Mm -hmm. For me, the, that's not what it's about. It's for me, it's about finding a way to have the spiritual life be the physical life so that it is, you know, family life is a spiritual act and gardening is a spiritual act. And, you know, everything bringing that consciousness into the earthly realm. And to me, that's what's been missing in the Western mm -hmm. world. You know, that, that separation has become so extreme that we, we no longer see or treat the earth as, as a sacred um, being, as a sacred organism, which gives us carte blanche to do whatever the hell we like, you know, and create all kinds of a mess. And similarly, even with our body, you know, a lot of people's relationship to the body is like that. Mm. It's not seen as, as a sacred vehicle for the divine intelligence, you know, the divine consciousness, the divine consciousness. And, and, it, and it needs to be. And, it, and in a sense, it's only when we have that perspective that we can, we can approach the material in the right spirit, in the right way. Mm. Yes. There's, um, there's something so beautifully simple in what you've just described. And yet it's also like, that is the invitation. That's the work. That's the you know, the challenge often to be able to live in a way where that's not just an idea, but that is how we're living. And yeah. my, my own experience of that, but also um, with students is, I think for most of us, that's a kind of remembering and a forgetting and a remembering to remember again. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's absolutely it, isn't it? And now you see it, now you don't. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this has been. Um, I'm really glad it was one of those moments. Where I'm like, why is Steiner like tugging on on, on my attention? But uh, what what you then just said, it was just like, oh, I'm glad I trusted. That, that was a boat example, wasn't it? Of like just trusting that that moment of like, there's some the reason why I want to go back to him. Um, but this has been a fabulous conversation, Ian. We've gone in places I really wasn't expecting to at all, but I'm so pleased we have had it. And where can listeners find out about you and your work? Um, thank you, Leanne. Um, I love exploring this uh, realm with you, especially, I think, because you've also got a very broad um, perspective on these things, which I love. Um, yeah, the website is the place to find me, which is called the, the insightspace.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ian. Until next time, I'm sure we'll be back having a conversation again at some point soon. But for now, thank you so much. Big pleasure. Thank you.